Greetings to one and all. So once again, we meet on this online platform. You know, one thing I did during this lockdown period was just appreciate the natural things that we have been blessed with. This pandemic has caused the shortage of food, something which we would never expect. And then a thought came to my mind, what can we do to sustain ourselves? Well, one way to do so is to grow our own food and that we do not have to rely much on external sources. So I started a vegetable garden. And believe me, I get certain foods all throughout the year. So if you haven't started your own garden, well, now is the time to start. So this session is all about the dietary sources of macronutrients. And then I will talk about the digestion of macronutrients in the body. So you are watching part three of this chapter titled Macronutrients in Food. Okay, I'm going to start my presentation. Let me start my presentation. In today's session, I will be covering the dietary sources and digestion of macronutrients. I really hope that you have understood part one and two of this chapter, as it is important to comprehend today's part three session. Just a reminder that I have divided this chapter into various parts. The scope, I will be providing a detailed list about the dietary sources of macronutrients and their balanced intake. Their pathway of digestion in the body will also be explained. By the end of this module, you will be able to identify the sources of macronutrients in food, understand the importance of consuming macronutrients in balance, generalize how the body metabolizes macronutrients. Let us just recap what was done in the previous session. Well, I had spoken about the classification of macronutrients. Okay, uh, the first one I did was carbohydrates. I had spoken about the classification of carbohydrates. This flowchart represents the broad classification of carbohydrates. The building blocks of any carbohydrate is the monosaccharide made up of one sugar unit. So two monosaccharides join to form a disaccharide and several monosaccharides join to form oligosaccharides which exists in short chains. And finally, large chains of sugar units or monosaccharides join to form long chains. Right? And uh, this is called as polysaccharides. I also discussed the concept of simple carbohydrates, which are called fast releasing carbohydrates and the complex or the slow releasing carbohydrates. Then I also did the classification of protein, okay, where they're divided into essential and non-essential amino acids, complete, partially complete, incomplete, and complementary protein. I also cover the classification of lipids, simple lipids, compound lipids, and derived lipids. We did the types of fatty acids, essential and non-essential fatty acids. Then I also threw some light upon how macronutrients are interdependent and how we should consider all the nutrients to be part of a family. So as you can see in the picture, certain foods contain more than one macronutrient. Well, thanks to the globalization of food, most types of foods are easily available to us in the market today. We get exotic foods that were not even seen many years back. Hence, foods are made accessible to us either in the original form, example, whole fruit, or in the processed form, for example, canned fruit. One thing that we must realize here is that the nutritional value of these two forms will differ. The value is the highest when we have the food in the pure or the cooked form. But as soon as we start buying processed versions, we must remember to check the nutritive value on the package. So today I will be covering the various sources of these macronutrients. We'll start with the first one, dietary sources of carbohydrates. The most common and abundant forms of carbohydrates are sugars, fibers, and starches. What is most important is the type of carbohydrate that you choose to eat because 
Some sources are healthier than others. The amount of carbohydrate in the diet, whether high or low, is less significant than the type of carbohydrate in the diet. For example, healthy whole grains such as whole wheat bread, rye, barley, and quinoa are better choices than highly refined white bread or french fries. Also keep in mind that it's more important to eat the right source of carbohydrates from healthy foods rather than to follow a strict diet where you limit or constantly count the number of calories. Here we take a look at the healthy sources and the not so healthy sources. So the healthiest sources of carbohydrates are the unprocessed or minimally processed whole grains, vegetables, fruit, legumes and beans. Whole carbohydrates are unprocessed and contain the fiber found naturally in the food, whereas refined carbohydrates have been processed and the natural fiber is stripped out. They generally promote good health by delivering vitamins, minerals, fiber and a host of important phytonutrients. Okay, I'm referring here to the unprocessed carbohydrates or the whole one or the whole carbohydrates. So we have whole versus refined carbs. The not so healthy sources of carbohydrates called as refined carbohydrates include white bread, white pasta, white rice, pastries, sugar sweetened beverages and other highly processed or refined foods. These items contain easily digested carbohydrates that may contribute to weight gain interfere with weight loss and promote diabetes and heart disease. So not all carbohydrates are created equally. Numerous studies show that refined carbohydrate consumption is associated with health problems like obesity and type 2 diabetes. They tend to cause major spikes in the blood sugar, which leads to a subsequent crash that can trigger hunger and cravings for more high carb foods. Refined carb carbohydrate foods are usually also lacking in essential nutrients. In other words, they are empty calories. So several studies on high fiber carbohydrates show that eating them is linked to improved metabolic health and a lower risk of disease. Take a look at the sources of carbohydrates in general. We have grains, dairy, pulses and legumes, vegetable and fruit, nuts and seeds and other sources. Here we see a detailed list of the carbohydrate sources. Now, why is meat not a source of carbohydrate? The reason is, when an animal is alive, the meat has carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. We eat meat that is not alive anymore. Cells don't die immediately when the animal in general dies. Okay, they keep running their chemistry until they run out of either fuel or oxygen. That process depletes enough of their stored glycogen that we count the remainder as zero during rigor mortis. So the only carbohydrate stored in the muscle, okay, that the meat is in the form of glycogen, which rapidly degrades after the death of the animal. So the rest of the carbohydrates an animal eats are combined with a glycerol molecule and stored as fats. So we don't mostly consume the blood and the cells use up most of their energy stored before they stop functioning. Liver and veal would typically have some non-trivial amount of residual carbohydrate in them. But again, we don't consider animal foods, that means meats, to be a source of carbohydrate. The only animal food is dairy. How to make the right choices? Well, here are some tips. Start the day with whole grains. Try a hot cereal like oats or a cold cereal that lists a whole grain first on the ingredient list and is low in sugar. A good rule of thumb, choose a cereal that has at least 4 grams of fiber and less than 8 grams of sugar per serving. Use whole grain breads for lunch or snacks. So look for a bread that lists as the first ingredient whole wheat, whole rye or some other whole grain. And even better, one that is made with whole, only whole grains, such as 100% whole wheat bread. Mixed grain bread that is prepared at home or locally is the best. 
So instead of bread, you can also try a whole grain in salad form, such as brown rice or quinoa. Another tip is choosing whole fruit instead of juice. An orange has two times as much fiber and half as much sugar as a one and a half glass of orange juice. Rather than filling up on potatoes, which have been found to promote weight gain, choose beans for an excellent source of slowly digested carbohydrates like beans and other legumes such as chickpeas, which also, in addition to carbohydrates, will provide a dose of nutrient like protein. The overview of digestion. So as you can see here, when the food gets digested, a polymer breaks down to give a monomer. So in the case of carbohydrate, it breaks down into glucose units, single glucose molecules. In the case of lipids, it breaks down into a fatty acid and a glycerol. And in case of proteins, we get an amino acid okay, and other amino acids once the bonds have been broken. The digestion of carbohydrate in our body. Digestion converts the food we eat into smaller particles, which will be processed into energy or used as building blocks. So in the case of carbohydrates, the digestion functions on two levels, mechanical and chemical. Once the smaller particles have been broken down, they will be absorbed and processed by the cells throughout the body for energy or, you know, for use as building blocks for new cells. So in this case, we're talking about it is broken down finally to give glucose. You will understand this better from this picture. Okay. So here we see. Take note of the enzymes, salivary amylase and pancreatic amylase, polysaccharides, starch, uh, which is a polysaccharide breaks down into dextrins, which breaks down into maltose and further breaks down into glucose. Disaccharides, since they are only two monosaccharides unit joined together, they break down into their respective monosaccharides. And monosaccharides get absorbed in their form, okay, either glucose, fructose, and galactose, which get further processed and absorbed. I'm just going to show you a video now.
Okay, so you can click on this link to watch the video again. Now I will be covering the dietary sources of protein. The nutritional value of a protein is measured by the quantity of essential amino acid that it contains. Different foods contain different amounts of essential amino acids. Generally, animal products such as chicken, beef or fish and dairy products have all the essential amino acids and are known as complete protein or ideal or high quality protein. Okay, soya products, quinoa and the seed of a leafy green called amaranth okay also have all of the essential amino acids whereas plant proteins beans lentils nuts and whole grains usually lack at least one of the essential amino acids and are considered as incomplete or partially complete proteins some food sources of dietary protein include okay as you can see the two sources plant sources and animal sources so under lean meats we have beef lamb veal etc under poultry we have chicken turkey duck goose etc fish and seafood there's fish prawns crab lobster mussels scallops etc eggs is a very good source of protein dairy products there is milk yogurt cheese under the nuts and seeds category we have almonds pine nuts walnuts hazelnuts cashew nuts uh, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, and the uh, nut butters, okay, like peanut butter. Legumes and beans is also another source. All beans, lentils, chickpeas, tofu, etc. come in this category. Some grain and cereal-based products are also sources of protein, but are generally not as high in protein as meat and meat alternative products. Please note that the protein requirements for children and teenagers change as they grow. Okay, the best way for you to get the protein that you need is to eat a wide variety of protein rich foods as outlined in the dietary guidelines as part of a balanced diet. But if you are still interested in using protein shakes, powders and supplements, please speak to your dietitian first. Okay, this is one way to make healthy choices. Here we see the different conversions and how much of protein you actually get from each serving. So for example, so we have one cup of milk, which is one serving, will give you around 10 to 15 grams of protein per serving. These are some vegan sources. In case you are a vegetarian, you can pick out from these choices. Getting more protein into your day's diet naturally. So if you're looking for ways to get more protein into your diet, here are some suggestions. Try a peanut butter sandwich. You know, remember to use natural peanut butter or any other nut paste with no added salt, sugar or other fillers. A low fat cottage or ricotta cheese is also high in protein and can go well on your scrambled eggs in a casserole, mashed potato or a pasta dish or spread it on your toast in the morning. Nuts and seeds are fantastic in salads with vegetables and served on top of curries. Okay, sometimes you can try roasting some pine nuts or almonds and putting them in the green salad. Beans are great in soups, casseroles and pasta sauces. Okay, a plate of hummus and freshly cut vegetable sticks as a snack or, you know, hummus spread on your sandwich will also give you that extra protein that you require. Greek yogurt is very good. So you can put a spoonful on top of a bowl of soup or serve it in a dessert a, with some fresh fruit. Okay, some fat diets promote very high protein intakes of around 200 to 400 grams per day. This is more than five times the amount recommended in the dietary guidelines. So please remember the protein recommendations in the guidelines provide enough protein to build and repair muscles, even for bodybuilders and athletes. So don't fall prey to such fat diets because a high protein diet can strain the kidneys and liver. It can also promote 
excessive loss of the mineral calcium, which can increase your risk of osteoporosis. Now let us see what happens to the protein in the body. The first step in digestion involves chewing. So the teeth begin the mechanical breakdown of the large pieces into smaller pieces that can be swallowed. The salivary glands provide some saliva to aid swallowing and the passage of the partially mashed food through the esophagus. The stomach releases gastric juices containing hydrochloric acid and the enzyme pepsin, which initiate the breakdown of the protein. The acidity of the stomach facilitates the unfolding of the proteins that still retain part of their three-dimensional structure. Pepsin, which is secreted by the cells that line the stomach, dismantles the protein chains into smaller and smaller fragments. Okay, so the stomach empties this mixture containing the broken down protein pieces into the small intestine, where the majority of protein digestion occurs. The pancreas secretes digestive juice that contains more enzymes that further break down the protein fragments. The cells that line the small intestine releases additional enzymes that finally break apart the smaller protein frag fragments into individual amino acids. The muscle contractions of the small intestine mix and propel the digested protein to the absorption sites. And once the amino acids are in the blood, they are transported to the liver. So as with all other macronutrients, the liver is the checkpoint for amino acid distribution and any further breakdown of amino acids. Okay, I'm going to show you a video now to explain what happens to protein in the body.
Now let us look at the dietary sources of lipids. As I explained in the part two, uh, we have phospholipids, okay, here, triacylglycerols, also known as triglycerides, and tiny percentage of sterols, which is mostly manufactured in the body, like cholesterol, etc. So here we see the sources of lipids, which are divided into endogenous source and exogenous source. All right, the exogenous source, I'll just speak about that, are the lipids obtained through the diet, okay, uh, which are triacylglycerols, which is 90%. Okay, then phospholipids, cholesterol, cholesterol esters, free fatty acids, and fat-soluble vitamins. The endogenous source. Okay, are lipids which are synthesized in the body. Okay, fatty acids, triacylglycerols, cholesterol, cholesterol esters, and phospholipids. A great exogenous source, okay, which is externally, uh, needs to be supplied by the food. Animal sources like milk, butter, ghee, meat, egg yolk, pork, and vegetable sources are oils from various oil seeds like groundnut, sunflower, coconut, mustard seed, cotton seed, etc. So these are the sources of fats and oils, which are produced from three different sources, animals, vegetable, okay, which also includes fruit like avocado, and fish. Then we have hidden lipids. Hidden lipids is a lipid that is in the food, but we can't say how much is there in the food. So they are basically in the hidden form. When we separate the fats and oils from these hidden sources, we call them the visible sources or the visible lipids. So they are broken down into subcategories. These sources are milk, okay, animal, like lard, tallow, and sweat from pork, beef, Okay, they get all these, and they are the products, the refined versions. So lard comes from pork, tallow is from beef, and sweat is from around the organs. Marine sources, so you get cod liver oil. Okay, you must have heard of those cod liver oil tablets. Halibut oil and shark oil. And under the vegetable sources, they are divided into fats, which are mostly solid at room temperature. The only exception is coconut oil and palm oil, which are tropical oils. And we have oils which are liquid at room temperature. There are various types of fats, and uh, you know some types of fats are better for you than others. So try to choose monounsaturated or polyunsaturated fats. These fats are liquid at room temperature. Okay, monounsaturated fats are especially healthy because they lower the bad cholesterol, that is the LDL in your, in your blood. These fats include olive, canola, avocado, and nut oils. Limit the saturated and the trans fats. So saturated fats are found in foods that come from animals, such as meat and dairy products. These kinds of fats are solid at room temperature. So hardened fats such as coconut or palm kernel oils, as well as oils that have been hydrogenated, also contain saturated fat. These can damage your heart and arteries, so we need to be careful here. Trans fats are found in most processed foods and many fried foods such as french fries, etc. They help the food to stay fresh longer, but they are just as bad for you as saturated fats. However, some saturated fats are healthy for us. Okay, please note this. But of course, we have to have them in moderation. As I explained, okay, also in part two, when we were doing the classification, okay, these are the essential and non-essential fatty acids that we need. So I'm going to show you the essential fatty acids, okay, which are omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids. This I'll also explain in part two. This is just a, you know, revision of it. So sources of omega-3 fatty acids, if you see, the good, the better, and the best sources. 
All right, so we can make a choice in a better way if we know in which group they fall in. These are the sources of omega-6 fatty acids. These are some rich sources of lipids. Okay, as per fitness uh, sites, these have been voted as nine of the healthiest fat sources. Now, let me ask you, what will you choose? Okay, you can take your time and you can point the finger, although I can't see you pointing, but if you choose the first category, all the healthy fats, then thumbs up to you. Okay, you're right. These are to be limited. So this is sausages. Again, we have cocktail sausages, ham, and, you know, uh, burgers, which may, may have some trans fats, sweets, okay, which have fats in them. Again, pizza should not be consumed very often. If you've pointed this out, well, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> you will be gobbled and you will turn out like this couch potato. So basically he's only sitting and eating where whatever he eats, whether carbohydrates or protein or fat will get stored as fat okay? because he's not spending it. <laughs> now let me talk about the digestion of lipids. So in the stomach, fat is separated from uh, other food substances. In the small intestine, bile emulsifies fats while enzymes digest them. The intestinal cells absorb the fats. Long-chain fatty acids form a large lipoprotein structure called a chylomicron that transports fats through the lymphatic system. Chylomicrons are formed in the intestinal cells and carry the lipids from the digestive tract into circulation. Short and medium chain fatty acids can be absorbed directly into the bloodstream from the intestinal microvilla because they are water soluble. Cholesterol absorption is hindered by foods which are high in fiber. So that means that, you know, if you have a fatty rich snack and if you put in nice fibrous foods like a lettuce leaf or spinach, etc., that will cut down on the absorption of cholesterol in our body and therefore you can monitor your levels of LDL and HDL. When energy supplies are low, the body utilizes its stored fat reserves for energy. So I'm just going to show you a video to support what I've just said.
Now I will talk about how to make a balanced meal or basically showing you that balance is the key. Your success with weight management and sustaining a healthy life will come from adopting a balanced style of eating. Each one provides the body with unique goodness. So the key to healthy, you know, for life eating is including all three in the appropriate ratios, which ensures that you get all the nutrients that you need. According to the National Academy of Sciences, current recommendations for healthy diets, okay, uh, for adults suggest 10 to 35 percent of calories from protein, 20 to 35 percent from fat, okay, or lipids, and 45 to 65 percent from carbohydrates. So restricting one macronutrient like carbohydrate means missing out on the vital benefits that they provide for the body. Similarly, if you go overboard on another micronutrient, Okay, on another macronutrient such as protein results in unwanted side effects like I told you earlier. So take a second to imagine this distribution by visualizing a healthy plate. So let's break that down a bit more because not all carbs, protein and fats are created equally. So carbohydrates, when choosing carbohydrates to fill up half your plate, look for Complex carbohydrates such as vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes. The more color, the better. These type of carbohydrates are filled with fiber, so you know to, it keeps you feeling full and satisfied, unlike refined grains like white breads and pastries that have almost no fiber. So fiber also plays an important role in improving digestion, regulating blood sugar, and lowering cholesterol. Proteins, so when choosing proteins, aim for lean options such as fish, skinless poultry, and legumes. Uh, eggs also are a very good option. Protein promotes satiety, preserves lean muscle mass, and stabilizes sugar. Finally, look for healthy lipids such as nuts and seeds, avocado, and olive oils to make up the last part of your plate. These fats will not only keep you full, but also will help you to absorb nutrients. And of course, vitamins and minerals should be a vital part of your diet. And this portion here, this, you know, indulgence can be like probably once in a month, it's fine. <laughs> so bodies are different and people's goals are different. A bodybuilder, for example, might aim for 40 to 60% of the diet from carbohydrates, while a person trying to shed off body fat might reduce the carbohydrates to 10 to 20 percent of the total food that they eat in a day. Okay, so then they try to compensate it by eating more protein, but it has to be balanced. Some people advise that your ideal macronutrient balance should also take into account your body type. So now I would like to give you an activity. It's called monitor your food. What you have to do is go to your kitchen and make two lists of foods that you see. One list will be of whole foods, like for example, apple, okay, oh, then you have grains, dals, etc. Vegetables also, and fruit would come in this category. So for that, I already have a list which has the nutritive value mentioned. The next list you will make is of packaged foods. Then the second step is you write down the nutritive content of each of the packaged foods from the nutritional labels. Okay, so every packaged food has a nutritional label. Once you do that, you put the data in a tabular form as it is shown in the example below. So what I had at home was a kurkure packet made with dal, corn, and rice. Here you have to write down the total number eaten in the entire week. So you're going to make a big chart now and you're going to keep this part blank. At the end of the week, you fill up this figure of how many you have eaten of this particular type of snack. Then you write down the energy that it provides, the carbohydrate content, the lipid content, and the protein content. All right. And all these values you will get from the package itself. Once you do that, the last step is to write the count of how many packaged foods you have eaten. And by doing this, you will be able to monitor how much you are eating 
okay, per day and per week also. So please do this task and you just see for yourselves how much of whole foods you're consuming and how much of packed foods. So for the whole foods, you do not have to make a table like this. You just have to write down whole foods and how much you have eaten because all the other things like the energy and the carbohydrate and lipid and protein content, the values are already there. Okay, You'll find it on the internet. But what you need to do is this part. Okay, of writing from the package because that's what you have in your house. All right, I hope you have understood this activity and I'm sure you'll have fun doing it. All right, to summarize, just remember that everything should be eaten in moderation. As we review the established guidelines for daily macronutrient intake, the importance of balancing the consumption from the healthy sources is very crucial. So it is not about quantity, but quality of the food also. The next teaching session will be on the functions of macronutrients. Okay, I'd like to say a small caption at the end of each lecture. So eat better and feel better is the message for today. All right, goodbye, dear students. See you until next time.